Hello and welcome to our August Publications Podcast. I'm Ed Vital from the University of Leeds. I'm chair of the Lupus Forum and this month I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague Professor Richard Fury who's chief of the uh, Division of Rheumatology at the Department of Medicine at Northwell Health in New York and also Professor of Medicine at the Zucker School of Medicine. So, hi Richard. Hello Ed. So uh, we chose four four papers um, this month to, to discuss. One's a clinical trial, two are post hoc analyses of other trials, and then one's actually an animal study, a bit unusually. So did you want to start on the, uh, the long-term data on uh, Voxlosporin? Yeah, I think that's a good paper to start with by Saxena and his colleagues. It summarized the long-term extension of the Voxlosporin lupus nephritis study, which was called Aurora 1, the extension called Aurora 2. So just for some brief background for our listeners, Voxlosporin was approved for lupus nephritis by the FDA based upon a complete response effect size at one year of 18 percentage points. Patients were eligible to continue into the extension study. Now the design of the extension was quite unique in that patients remained on their assigned therapy from the first phase of the study. That is Voxlosporin, or placebo, all on a background of mycophenolate. Of those remaining on voclosporin, the majority were taking 27.5 milligrams twice per day. And the only other placebo-controlled extension study in lupus that I can think of was the long-term extension following the first phase of the anafrolimab lupus studies. So this kind of design is somewhat unique. This paper reported on two years of data, both safety and efficacy. 216 patients transitioned into this extension, representing about 85% of those who completed the first phase of the study. And of those who enrolled in the extension, a similar percentage, about 86%, completed two years of study. One of the most interesting questions to be addressed was whether chronic administration of voclosporin was potentially nephrotoxic and might impact the GFR. And although 12% of patients in the Voclosporin group had a 30% or greater reduction in their GFR, 10% in the control group had similar GFR reductions. But in aggregate, the slope of GFR over the two years was pretty flat, minus 0.2 mLs per minute for the Voclosporin group, whereas the control group had a slope of minus 5 mLs per minute. The bottom line was that long-term voclosporin was safe, it was well-tolerated, it seemed to be efficacious. And although there were slightly more patients in the voclosporin group who developed hypertension, the difference was quite small. There were greater reductions in proteinuria and more complete responders in the voclosporin group, 50% versus 40% in the placebo group. Okay, great. So uh, that, yeah, like as you say, that that maintenance of the randomization is really useful thing to have in long term studies, isn't it? Because we're always left with wondering who's still in the study towards the end of the extension period, and our bias is starting to appear. And I, I particularly looked at the infection rate here because there's an interesting story, isn't there, with the phase two data on voclosporin compared to the original phase three. Yeah, well, in the extension, infection, adverse events, and serious infections were quite similar between the two groups. And there was an interesting observation about COVID. And I guess there is some in vitro data that, that this drug, voclosporin, might be protective against COVID. So anyway, uh, so back to COVID infections. Uh, there were fewer COVID infections in the voclosporin group. And there were three deaths due to COVID in this study, but they were all in the control group. So we need to see more uh, evaluation of this class of drugs, or particularly voclosporin as far as its relationship to COVID. Yeah, because there was this phase two data that suggested there may be some really serious safety signals with voclosporin. But I think the conclusion of that, wasn't it, was that it was it was only because there was a slightly strange there were, there were people who had a lot of comorbidities falling into certain groups and things like that. So, uh, and then that never, that didn't come out in the phase three at all. And then here you've got this potentially even some, you know, quite reassuring safety with Voxlosporin. 
Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, a, a large number of deaths in the phase two, actually in the lower of the two doses, yeah. but that was not seen in phase three, nor was it seen in the extension. There were four de deaths overall in the extension study, but they were all in the control group. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and you, yeah. So, and then, um, and what do you feel overall about the kind of response rates that were achieved in this study? Well, I feel good and bad. <laughs> so 18 percentage point effect size in Aurora one, you know, we kill for that in lupus yeah. nephritis, but it still leaves the majority of our patients with lupus nephritis not achieving our goal. And so we still need to do better, but it's just gratifying because I've been doing this for decades now to see two new drugs approved for lupus nephritis. Yeah. Yeah, that was exactly what I thought. I thought the main thing I'm noticing in here is how bad the standard of care is, actually, because patient standard of care we've had for a long time is mycophenolate plus steroids or maybe cyclophosphate plus steroids. And, and you don't hit many of the targets you're meant to be hitting with just that. So I think combining with something is a good idea. OK, so um, on to the next study. So this is the this is the post hoc analysis of the of the bliss LN study. So this exactly as you said, we've got two two licensed drugs here for lupus nephritis and this is the other one. So belimumab was licensed as an add on to standard of care. Um, so that could be mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide in this in this study. They allowed both. Um, uh, so uh, on, in addition to standard of care, you've got Bolimumab or placebo, and the studies that have been published so far showed that bolimumab was associated with higher rates of renal response and lower rates of flares. So we've got a license based on that. But this is to, this paper is to look at some other aspects. Um, so one thing is that we already know that patients with lupus nephritis who are having a relapse, like a second or a third episode of lupus nephritis are generally at higher risk of end-stage renal failure than patients who are on their first episode of end-stage renal failure. So that, that when we think about bringing in new drugs, that's one thing we have to think about. Is this, is this for everyone or is it more valuable on your first episode or is it more valuable later episode? And then the second thing that's being looked at in this study is about the way that the glucocorticoids are given because um, in, in some people will give intravenous methoprednisolone and then oral steroids and other people will not. They will just go straight to oral steroids on their own. There's a bit of evidence in the past that if you do the, the IV pulse plus a medium dose of glucocorticoids, it may be better than a, a high dose of glucocorticoids from the start. Um, and in this study, that was optional. So that's another thing that's been looked at as a post hoc analysis is what difference do these um, do the, do these two do these groups make? Firstly, looking at patients who are having a new episode versus patients who are relapsing. So on the response rates for that new versus relapse. So if you just look at the placebo arms, as you might expect, the patients who are on a relapse are doing a bit less well than the patients who are on a first episode of lupus nephritis. And Belimumab improves the situation in both cases. So on patients who are having a new episode, you've kind of got 37% meeting the primary endpoint on placebo versus 46% if with belimumab. And on the relapses, it's 22% versus 36%. So they both gain um, and the relapses do a little bit worse and perhaps gain slightly more from belimumab. Um, and you looked at complete renal responses, that pattern was kind of the same, but maybe a little bit more exaggerated. So if you're a relapser, um, then your chance of getting a complete renal response on just standard therapy plus placebo was only 11%. But if with belimumab in those patients, it's going up to 23%. So relapsers do pretty badly on standard therapy, but belimumab helps. And then um, the other thing that was looked at was then whether patients received pulses or not. So here, I think I found the numbers a little bit more confusing, a little bit harder to understand because 
the patients who received IV pulses of steroids actually did less well overall than the ones who hadn't. Whether you look at the placebo arms or whether you look at the bulimia arms, the general trend is overall people having IV steroids did a little bit less well than the ones who hadn't. And the reasons for that, might, this isn't randomized therapy. So the reasons why the ones having the IV steroids did less well might be because it's confounding by indication. So, you know, if the, the physician was more worried about somebody, then maybe more likely to give them IV pulses. And that's why they did, that's why it's associated with worse responses. It's not causative. Or it, the other thing that was seen, I noticed, was it's something to do with the region. So there are, there are some regions of the world that were more likely to use IV steroids. And we already know that different regions of the world have different outcomes in lupus nephritis. So that part is a little bit more confusing to get your head around the numbers. But the overall message here is, is that in all these scenarios, having bulimumab is somewhat better than having placebo. What did you think of this one? Well, I was the second author, so <laughs> I had to recuse myself. <laughs> uh, but, you know, talking about unique design. So this was unique in that patients for their background therapy could receive mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. There's only been one other lupus nephritis trial where that was allowed, yeah. and that was the ocrelizumab trial. So I have some questions you can speculate on. So because they could receive mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide as background therapy, uh, I'm just wondering, so a greater proportion of the patients in the relapse group receive cyclophosphamide compared to the newly diagnosed group. And it gets to pretty much what you just talked about. So I just wonder if this uh, discordance between use of cyclophosphamide could have been responsible for the greater response rates in the relapse group compared to the newly diagnosed group. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, because um, and, and we don't. I don't think we can definitely say from these data, do we? Um, but uh, and because there's again, it probably becomes quite a complicated question because when you go to the studies that looked at mycophenolate versus cyclophosphamide, there are certain subgroups who seem to benefit more from one drug than from the other, like um, some of the ethnic groups have differences. So it, it gets really complicated to work out what's causing what, doesn't it? But it is a possibility, I agree. Yeah, another uh, item that really struck me was flare rates. So we had demonstrated a reduction in flare in the bulimumab treated patients. Yeah. And it's once, a me uh, once again mentioned here so evaluating flare rates, whether one was newly diagnosed or a relapse. And it was really gratifying to see a 50% reduction in flare rates in both groups, in the newly diagnosed and the relapsed group. Yeah. And I just wonder, you know, how much these data about flare prevention affects a clinician's choice in using this particular drug. I don't know that you have access there in England, but here in the US, uh, we do have access, but I still see a lot of doctors who are using monotherapy, meaning to say just mycophenolate alone, as opposed to using combination mycophenolate and bulimumab. Any thoughts about yeah. whether the flare rate has impacted people's I mean, decision making? I, yeah, I think the data on the flare rates is, it is to me, very persuasive. Um, and again, it gets back to that point. One episode of lupus nephritis, you're going to lose some nephrons, even if you get a good outcome from your therapy, but that'll be okay. But once you start getting second, third, then your long-term you know, lifetime outcome of your of your of your your, your renal outcome is, is is getting worse every time. So preventing flares is really important. And I think we know that if you have mycophenolate alone, there is there is still a significant uh, as a maintenance therapy like we used to do, there is still a significant flare rate. Um and it's it's unclear how long you really should continue mycophenolate when there's a safe time to stop. So yeah, to me, um, having other drugs that maintain the benefit, maintain response over time is definitely valuable. Yeah, so my last question for you is about the pulse steroid data. And the question is whether the message might be misinterpreted, meaning you don't really need to use pulse. Yeah, it doesn't really tell us that, does it? Because they were they were free to choose whether they did it or not. 
I think. All right, we should probably move on. Yeah. So the next paper is by Joan Merrill and her colleagues, and it's entitled Obexilamab. It's hard to pronounce. I may say Obexi in yeah. <laughs> this podcast. Uh, so this Obexi is a monoclonal antibody that has a dual mechanism of action. It targets CD19, but in addition, it binds the FC gamma R2B receptor, which is an inhibitory receptor. So this molecule is not cytolytic, but it downregulates B cells, plasma blasts, and plasma cells. And the design was a bit atypical, but very creative. It enrolled patients with active lupus, treated them with intramuscular steroids, so the so-called BOLD, B-O-L-D design, mm -hmm. and withdrew their immunosuppressants. Patients could remain on 10 milligrams or less of prednisone, and they could remain on hydroxychloroquine. Those who improved were then randomized to Obexi or placebo. And the endpoint, which was at week 32, was a unique endpoint. It was the proportion of patients without loss of improvement. And loss of improvement was defined as a four-point or greater increase in SLEDI, a new or worse bilag A or B. And although 42% of the Obexi group achieved this endpoint compared to just 29% in the placebo group, the difference was not statistically significant. However, the time to loss of improvement was prolonged in the treatment arm. Now, looking at some of the pharmacodynamics, they found that CD19 receptor occupancy, greater than 90%, was maintained in the treatment group throughout the study. And there was a 50% reduction in B cells in those who received Obexi treatment. The investigators also used gene array analysis and identified a group of patients that responded to drug. So I'm not sure about the fate of this drug. CD19 certainly as a target has received a lot of attention recently. There's an antibody to CD19 that was approved for NMO called inabelizumab. And of course, we've been hearing a lot about CD19-directed CAR-T therapy for lupus nephritis. Yeah. So yeah, I think a CD20, there's going to be you know, very positive data, hopefully presented in the next couple of years with very potent B cell depleters, though they're targeting CD20. And we'll see what happens with those that target CD19. Yeah. So it, it, it is interesting, this design, isn't it? Um, and I was kind of thinking about the potential advantages of doing this. And I sort of thought, well, maybe one, one is that we know in lupus trials, you get a lot of high placebo responses. And I think one of the reasons you get a lot of high placebo responses is you, you tend to recruit everyone on their worst ever day. So, you know, the only way they the only thing they can do is regress to the mean and naturally improve. And you also tend to recruit patients who have a, a lot of skin and joint disease and not a lot of upper orbit. So I was kind of thinking, is that one of the advantages here that if you look for worsening instead of improvement, you're getting away from that regression to the mean? And maybe you'll start to see flares in other organs, not just skin and joints. So I, I thought about that, but I don't know if that's exactly how this trial is functioning, really. Well, we certainly need to shake up our designs because we haven't done so well over the last couple of decades. Yeah. I'm not sure this is the answer because, I mean, it's sort of a flare prevention or inverse flare prevention design. Yeah. And you're always held hostage to the flare rate. And that is risky. Because you don't know what it's going to be for any given group of people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, in terms of the target, I mean, this is, yeah, this is trying to, this is trying to inhibit B cell function rather than kill them, um, isn't it? And so, the, but there are so many, there are lots of very positive trials coming through of agents that just kill B cells completely, aren't there? The, there's the analumab, there's abinutuzumab, it's the CAR T story. So uh, it's understanding what's the advantage of inhibiting them rather than killing them completely, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, good question. Uh, <laughs> we don't know from this, do we? We don't know, yeah, certainly yeah. from this. I mean, the fact that it's immunomodulatory, I guess, sits better with us, maybe yeah. uh, reduce safety risk, but yeah. 
there's not enough data. I mean, certainly there, there didn't seem to be much in the way of uh, safety issues here. Okay. So shall we go on to the last one then? Sure. So this is one I looked at. This is the um, this is the animal study, which we don't normally feature too many animal studies. And the reason we don't usually feature too much isn't because we're not interested. It's because we try and highlight papers that we think are going to be have relevance to the clinic. But I sort of thought this kind of does have relevance to the clinic. And I, I do a combined um, rheumatology renal clinic. And these drugs are coming up all the time now. So um, the SGLT2 inhibitor story, if you're a rheumatologist like me, I had to read a little bit to understand it, um, that these drugs started out for diabetes by blocking the kidney's reabsorption of glucose. So they control blood glucose, but then it was noted in diabetes patients that they have lots of other beneficial effects. They, they lower the rates of cardiovascular events, they cause weight loss, they improve blood pressure and they lower proteinuria. So there you go. So you, that makes you think, what about all the other diseases why, where heavy proteinuria is a problem? So most of the data so far, the trial data has been in diabetics who may have quite heavy proteinuria. And exactly how these drugs do that is um, potentially quite complex. We don't know exactly what they do. They could work in many different ways. They could have this physiological effect on the kidney, like lowering the intraglomerular pressure. So that reduces hyperfiltration, similarly to how ACE inhibitors low to lower proteinuria. But then they could do completely different things, like they could improve the fitness of tubular epithelial cells by reducing their energy consumption, improving their mitochondrial function, less oxidative stress, et cetera. And they may do things to podocytes. So when we get into lupus nephritis, um, these things become interesting because the, what's going on in the kidney is quite different to diabetes. And so, you know, understanding what these drugs do should, may help guide us into saying whether should we be prescribing them to our lupus patients who have have a proteinuria. There's one letter in Annals of Rheumatic Diseases last year which was a series uh, from Spain with five patients who had significant proteinuria and were prescribed uh, one of the SGLT2 inhibitors. And they showed this quite impressive 50% reduction in level of proteinuria across the five patients with a stable EGFR. So it seems encouraging, but we don't have other more formal randomized trials yet. So what they did, in this one is, so this is animals. So they took an MRL LPR mouse model. So this is a mouse model where they've got a fast ligand mutation. So basically it means the autoreactive lymphocytes just proliferate like mad and they get uh, nephritis, lymphadenopathy and, and skin lesions. And they, they got some of these mice and they randomly assigned them to um, empaglyphosin. So one of the SGLT two inhibitors or just vehicle placebo and what they found was that the patients who were on the drug got less proteinuria but they got other things as well they got less as shown on the slide here they got less double-stranded dna antibodies which is maybe not the first thing i would have expected from the way this drug works they also found that the histology in the kidney was improved they could actually see a better scores on histology then they did some RNA sequencing analysis and they found that the gene set enrichment analysis showed less op apoptosis, less complement activation, less inflammation, less oxidative damage. And then they finished up by doing some studies on podocytes from these animals. Um, and what they found was that in the, so we, we normally, the traditional view is that a major effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors is on the proximal tubule, the tubular epithelial cells. But here, what we see is that the podocytes are also expressing this molecule. The more they express it, the more podocytopathy the patients have. And the drug seems to protect, improve the podocytopathy in a few different ways. It make, reduces their apoptosis, it reduces their NLRP three inflammasome and it increases autophagy which is this kind of self cleaning mechanism inside cells um so basically the conclusion here 
is that SGLT2 inhibitors look like, at least in animals, they are good drugs for lupus nephritis, consist with, consistent with the previous study, we, the, the, the case series we saw, saw last year, but that the benefits may be more wide ranging than just making you excrete less protein. They could actually really change the inflammatory process and the histology in the kidney and improve the podocytopathy. So that's why I highlight it, because in my combined clinic, we're often talking about whether to prescribe these drugs. And I thought this, this helps me understand you know, what I'm doing with them. Yeah, I'm glad you highlighted it. It's a very intriguing class of drugs. Yeah. And, uh, as you mentioned, the anti-DNA antibodies went down in these mice, and I'm just so curious. Yeah. Do you have any sense of why that might have happened? I mean, I was thinking about, I mean, I was just thinking that is what's happened, if, I mean, this is an animal model, of course, and it's a cleaner and purer situation than we see in the clinic, so we don't know if it's going to, but what I thought is that, is, is this a case that in lupus nephritis, what you've got is inflammation damages the kidney, it's killing cells in the kidney then you're getting more dead cells in the kidney those dead cells are further stimulating the autoimmune process because we know that dead cells are what stimulates lupus in the first place and it's going round and round like that more inflammation equals more cell killing more cell killing equals more inflammation so if there are if there are things there that sort of improve the fitness and reduce the apoptosis in the kidney and make make the kidney sort of a bit more resistant or recover better then maybe that ends up having a knock-on effect on antibody production. But that's just, so, a I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know either. Uh, so are you using SGLT2 inhibitors in your oh, I, I mean, I, I'm not prescribing them personally, but the nephrologist I works with um, prescribes them to all sorts of patients who have nephrotic range proteinuria. And I think to me, this including some of my lupus patients. And to me, this just highlights how we need better clinical data really to tell us what to do. Yeah, so along those lines, do you, are you aware of any clinical trials being performed I, in lupus nephritis with this? I of had a look. And as far as I, so the only ones I could see were there were some academic led studies uh, that were uh, registered in Egypt, but haven't actually recruited patients. But I can't see any sort of formal studies in progress. Um, so We'll, we'll probably learn a lot more from the clinic, I guess. It's one of those drugs where people will use it on a less specific license um, and we'll start to get real world evidence before we get trial evidence. Yeah, I mean, I've been prescribing, not to all, but to some of my patients, but yeah. I really can't tell what's happening. Yeah. And they're not cheap here in the United States. Yeah, they're not cheap. They're not cheap. But if you can get 50% reductions in protein urine, improved histology, and it's working in a different way to all the other drugs you use, so it's kind of a synergistic effect, then it's, I mean, that's, I guess, from our discussion of these papers we've talked about today, that's the the take home message from all of it, isn't it? Is that they, all these drugs do something different and none of them does everything on its own. So patients probably do need combinations. All right. Sounds like a good place to finish up. So uh, thanks very much. That's, uh, it's great to have your insight. As always, you know so much about these trials. Um, and thank you everyone for listening. Um, if you look on the Lupus Forum website, you can find full slide decks for the Saxena, Zhao and Anders papers. So you go to lupus-forum.com. It's free to access. All the content's free to download and you can use them in your own journal clubs and your, and your teaching. Um, so don't forget to register so that you get email updates whenever new content comes out. Thanks. <laughs>